Dank. Um, I apologize for speaking English uh, this evening. I was going to attempt German, but I haven't been in Germany for many years, and learning Norwegian completely messes up your German, <laughs> if you're an English person from Canada who also speaks French. <laughs> so, what the music tells me, art, self-reflexivity, and how they can inform artistic research. Now, the very sharp-eyed amongst you have already noticed that I've done that terrible thing that presenters do, and I've changed the title. I removed the word autoethnography and replaced it with self-reflexivity. That's an important strategy, and why I did that, I hope will become clear as this progresses. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Jakob Tagen for the invitation to speak here. Uh, the motto for this presentation, its theme, is a paraphrase. It's from this book, Manticore. And the paraphrase is this, the world is not your own idea. Um, I repeat this to myself almost every day to remind myself that. Now, I'd like to start by playing an excerpt of some music. Um, and it is a performance by this gentleman. His name is Ivar Grideland. He's um, a very well-known improviser in Norway. And he carried out a third cycle, doctoral level, uh, practice-based research project from 2012 to 2015. Uh, his, his project followed what we call the Norwegian model for artistic research, and that model emphasizes the artistic development of the researcher. That's something I'll come back to later, because I think it's important. The following will give you an idea of where he was artistically when that project came to an end in 2015. And this is an excerpt from a recording which is called Stop, Freeze, Wait, Eat. did this at the end of his project, and he accompanied it with a mandatory <coughs> self-reflection. In the Norwegian program, everybody on that program has to write or do some kind of self-reflective practice within the project. And he wrote this about what he had done. I recall a peculiar experience of time while recording this. It was an interesting blend of correspondence with an unreliable echo of myself while looking into the immediate future, planning my next echo. Confused whether what I played happened in the moment or moments ago. In more recent artistic research development work, attention has turned increasingly to ways in which autoethnography and self-reflexivity can continue to be developed as viable approaches to the conducting of musical research. Gridelan's work, I think, is significant because of the extent to which 
he places that self-reflective problem right in the heart of his improvisational practice. In other words, his improvisations are loops around his own previous improvisations. So he's reflecting through practice on his own practice. That's about as um, self-reflexive as you can get, I think. The title of his project reflected that. He called it Ensemble and Ensemble of Me. The very fact that promoters of artistic research are studying this kind of work, it demonstrates a shift of attitude that's taken place over a number of years for many reasons and across a wide spectrum of activity far beyond artistic research itself. An example, we know that musicology itself has transformed itself um, and that many eminent musicologists has catalyzed important moves in the direction toward the autoethnographical and the self-reflexive. On the one hand, they've done that by re-problematizing the identities of those whose stories has hitherto been presented as exemplary, the one-of-a-kind person. And that suggests that our collective musical past ought to be regarded as permeable, as soggy, damp, open-ended, and potentially having infinite re-readings and warning us to be wary of those constructs that recycle the heroic narrative for example, of the canonical white male composer. On the other hand, the self-same transformations have stimulated a similar problematizing of our own identities, and that suggests that all of us here who read works ought to also acknowledge our presence and our power as readers. One of the early signs of this shift was the emancipation, the freeing up of the biography as a vehicle for remaking musical identities and exposing the identities of those who had been previously invisible or on the margin. This has refreshed our view of the musical landscape and it's enriched our sense of the interdependent cultural ecosystems that we're all working on in from which canonical artists generally emerge, but it did something else at the same time. It reinforces that sneaky feeling that some of these artists may have become canonical for very good reasons. These moves were part of a wider shift that's gone far beyond the purview of the arts. It's permeating all kinds of other disciplines. In artistic research work with colleagues at the Orpheus Institute, and I believe you've heard from them a great deal, um, many involved soon became focused on theoretical writings of Hans Jörg Reinberger. You probably have discussed that figure too. If you haven't, he's a biochemist and philosopher working at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. And there at the Orpheus Institute, their work evolved into a full-scale European Union project with important developments by its principal investigator, Paolo de Assis, the senior researcher, Michael Schwab, and several others involved in the work. Now, what's important about that for our purposes today? Kreinberger's work has proven to be of interest to a wide range of artistic researchers here on the continent because of this idea of the experimental system and the essential notion that the creation of that system, its apparatus, if you will, and that's both the physical apparatus but also the conceptual apparatus that we use, it's not the controlled space of a scientific method, but it's a contingent arena. And the subjectivity of the experimenter is part of that arena. That means that we bring to life things like the unexpected, which sounds odd in a controlled experiment, but experimentation is about the unexpected. The new epistemic thing, new knowledge, or its potential. Experimentation, Kreinberger tells us, is an effective, emotive practice, not merely an objective, depersonalized following of rules. And this legitimizing message from a bona fide scientist has been seized upon enthusiastically, maybe at times too enthusiastically. Although I believe we must be extremely careful when we're using scientific language and models metaphorically, which this is, to describe the making of art, the parallels between Kreinberger's experimental system with his future knowledge and, say, the insight that emerges from certain kinds of musical performance, it has an undeniable persuasiveness. 
the resemblances they spark apply both in terms of the futurity of knowing in the act of performance, because you can't know the future of your performance until it's done, and in relation to the imprint of the practitioner, you, on that knowing in real time. This shift in understanding the nature of how do we form knowledge has in turn transformed aspects of our music disciplines. And we can map this transformation via the rise, first of all, in music of performance studies, and that's permeated far beyond music to dance as well, which this institution is enormously involved in, but to other kinds of performative arts. Um, this model that I'll discuss next is a rethinking of the 1993 essay by Christopher Frayling, who um, was rector at the Royal, Ecole Royal Academy of Arts in London. And this essay is called Research in Art and Design. Now, when I thought about it, when it was written up in words, I thought, but how can we relate that to these kinds of conservatoire ecosystems that we're working in? And I remade his essay in the following way. And you might want to reflect, how does this relate to your institution here in Köln? So you have a musical practice or a dance practice or whatever that art practice might be. And if we're all here in a community, that includes all of us. It also includes the people who help you to do that. And that's the people who might type letters, do timetables, or do the things that don't immediately seem related to that. It's this ecosystem. Now, musical practice for artistic research is a necessary condition for it, some kind of practice um, that is artistic. But for artistic research, probably not enough, because then we could say anybody could be doing artistic research at any time. So how do we qual qualify it? Freyling suggested the following. He said, what if you start to narrow it down by categories and call the next level of this research into music, art, design. And what he meant by that was to think about what you're doing when you're seeking information about what you're doing. Now, most of us, when we're learning, let's say, a piece of music, we'll try to find out about it. That seems like an obvious thing. But it is the next level of thing than simply doing the thing. It's trying to find out the world in which this lives. But it's an insufficient condition for artistic research. So, Freyling suggests another category, and that is research for music, art, and design. And this means, or this category suggests, that that information has to be reflected upon and then brought back into the practice in some way. That it's not just merely enough to find things out, but it has to be thought about what these things mean. The Norwegian system that I'll talk about later is very strong on this category, and that creates its own set of problems. But I think this is still an insufficient condition. And the reason I think it's insufficient is because of the last category, research through music, art, and design. And Freyling's suggestion, and I think it's a good one, is that what is needed is that rigorous methodological framework, that way of proving what you're doing. And it allows you to understand that you're still functioning in this large community with the people who are practicing, the people who are thinking a bit about their practice. But if you're doing artistic research, you need to have a way of situating it that has some rigor. That's the frailing argument for if anyone asks you, and as I'm sure they do, what's artistic research? That would be his argument. It's about where and how it is. Now, the focus on informed, reflective musical practice, that orange quadrant there, um, it can be seen in at least one model of artistic research that embraces mainly that self-reflection. And this is the Norwegian model I talked about earlier. Artistic development work, what they call in Nor Norway, kunstnerisk utviklingsarbeid. And that's the model that we saw at the beginning in the work of Iva Grideland. Although it was originally conceived as distinct from, uh, but equivalent to research practice, this artistic development is now understood, in Norway at least, as being a species of research. But its more liberal origins persist in, to some extent in the way that that research element is thought about, in Norway at least. And 
coming to Norway from an outsider, as an outsider, and still really being one, I think that's very interesting. And I'll return to it again later. Now, what does this start to mean for all of us? Because we're still at the beginning of this rather young discipline, but not so young as it once was. When you're part of discipline formation, you have these initially idealistic hopes, but they get traduced because of practical reasons, and also um, in many countries because competition for the resources to do this work is scarce. In continental Europe, in some countries, what the hope was when artistic research really got going, that was about 20 years ago, 25, the hope was that uh, artistic research would remove the walls f between scholarly work and artistic production and really give an authentic voice to practitioners uh, who possess really hybrid capabilities and who were often penalized in the academy for that. It was really hoped that those creating art would find ways of articulating their questions in their ways rather than remaining the subject of study where they would stay mute but be discussed by others. The idea was not that artistic research should replace music analysis or musicology. That wasn't the idea. But that is questions and therefore the way those questions would be answered would just be different we thought there was room and scope for everybody. But to adopt a loaded word like research is to raise a whole series of assumptions about the kind of activity that's being envisaged. Moreover, insofar as these assumptions may then be confounded by new paradigms being pr proposed, it's still a challenge to many decades, indeed generations of privileged status carefully guarded standards, and vested interests. The proponents of artistic research were challenged to provide explanations for what they thought they were doing, and this had the effect of moving the terrain of engagement inexorably from practice to discourse. I'm speaking now, I'm not playing, I'm speaking. This means that there's been a fresh battle of words some practitioners have struggled with that. They've struggled with scholarly discourse. They had a vocabulary for their practice, but it was more rough and intuitive than scholarly discourse. And crucially, it was rooted in the reality of their direct experience. For them, there was no <coughs> need to be squeamish or uncomfortable about articulating their arguments in the first person, about saying the word I and about right, referring to subjective experience. But meanwhile, practice scholars looked upon these efforts with some disdain, uttering that patronizing neologism, me-search, as if icicles hung from every syllable. For the reflective practitioners, however, personal experience is a kind of a lamp capable of illuminating the recesses of their creative actions. For skeptical scholars, however, its beams are simply bounced back, reflecting off the image of the subjective eye in a dazzling way that blinds the beholder, therefore not serving to illuminate but to obscure. But ultimately, what are we hoping for, therefore? Isn't it for a more reconciled view of what these things might do together? The polarizing of this terrain of discourse in artistic research led to an increasing defensiveness and created the conditions for the next wave, and I think this wave is happening now. This began with artist researchers venturing into territories of social science and philosophy, finding verbally resonant and therefore reassuring validation for these ideas, but now it's taking the reverse form. That is, the taking over of the artistic research space by social scientists and philosophers. Once again, practitioners, those who are making art, are in danger of having others speak on their behalf. And in this context, I think that's ironic that, for example, there are musicians who are often being reminded that they are not philosophers, whereas few people in that crowd seem brave enough to remind the philosophers that many times they are not musicians. So, we can see how highly charged the issues of self-reflexive 
self-reflexivity in musical research can be. We can see that while self-reflexivity opens up research to new kinds of conceptualizations and researchers to new challenges, it's also risky. Even its better manifestations will be dismissed generically by some, while poor examples will only serve to reinforce prejudice about its inability to measure up to a dominant perception that still exists about what research should be. But in Norway, things are a little different. Self-reflection in a PhD is not only encouraged, it's mandatory. I've tw twice referred to this Nordic model of artistic development work, and Norway enshrined that development with no additional justificatory apparatus, uh, not just as a right, but as an obligation, not only of people doing a PhD, by the way, but of all the um, instrumental teaching staff who have a salary above 80%. They're obliged to do self-reflexive work, and they're paid for it. As a part of this, um, an artistic fellowship program, very distinct from the PhD, evolved first. Now this has been adapted to granted full PhD status. That was ratified in January. The PhD in Kunstnerisk, Beginningsarbeit, it nevertheless continues to reflect Norway's development of this self-reflexive process embedded in socially conscious educational work. That's a kind of Norwegian stamp, a very Nordic style of working. This artistic research PhD has no thesis. Uh, you could do this PhD and not write a word. Few do that, by the way. But its main um, constitution is the making of art coupled with reflection on the processes that lead to that art. Now, most people do the reflection as writing, but there's no rule that says you have to. If you were very enterprising, and I wish someone would do it, you could do the reflection in the form of more art, as long as it fulfilled the required to reflect. Now, this is an exceptional situation. Norway is a country of about five million people, with a population that's reaping benefits of immense oil wealth and prudent investment. So those involved in discipline formation are in constant dialogue also with its Ministry of Education, because in five million, with five million people, you can actually talk to the Minister of Education. And it was that that really ensured that at a key point, just a few people, in, including the then rector of the Norwegian Academy, uh, went to the minister and said, this is what we think artistic research should be. And he said, basically, okay. <laughs> now, the first fellows enrolled on that program in 2006. But even now, 12 years later, that it's become this fully-fledged PhD, there are many challenges about this element of reflection. We haven't solved the problem of reflection at all. Reflexivity, subjectivity, autobiography, they've all colored the fellow fellowship program submissions, but these results have only been variably successful. So, the matter of reflection itself is now a research question for the national program in Norway. And that program, I remind you, it pays its fellows a generous salary and it offers generous postdoc group projects to address this. Now, a report that was commissioned um, by the Norwegian Artistic Research Program and authored by Erik Vassenden, uh, and this was written about 2013, it revealed that the reflective work of the fellows generally emerges in the form of practical consideration of three areas, with the relative emphasis on these areas being different according to the kind of project that the person was doing. Now, the first one you'd all recognize relating the artistic practice to the surrounding field. Now, any scientist does this. If you're going to do a kind of re a research project, you have to understand the field in which it's situated. But this is about the person's artistic practice and really knowing where it's sat. Then it gets a bit more interesting. Relating one's own artistic practice to the problem of articulation. And what that means is, how does the artistic practice articulate its own reality as research? How does it do that um, effectively? Because not all artistic research projects are effective in that. And then finally, 
there was the tracing of the relationship between one's own artistic practice and the personal experience of theoretical work and reflective work. And that, we need to really understand that. The personal experience of theoretical work. Now, that's not the same as immersing yourself in theory and becoming an expert on that theory. This is about how artists use theory for the making of art. The two things are very distinctive, and one of the problems with the fellows is they confuse the two. Um, the use of ideas in an artistic means is not necessarily always the mastering of those ideas. Now that sounds completely paradoxical, but it's, it's a problem. Now, the following extract now from this report, it will illustrate some of the challenges around these three criteria. <coughs> so, how do we put into words the experience of developing an artistic project or doing artistic work. All such attempts at articulation involve the writer, and note that this person said the writer, why? The writer finding a good and expedient language with which to describe his or her experience, a language that will also make it possible to share this experience theoretically and cognitively. That's a requirement of any research, including artistic research. There has to be the process of exchange. A language that enables not only the sharing of experience, but also the discussion and problematization of the experience, so that the creative practice, filtered through a different medium, also becomes visible to the creative subject. In this perspective, the attempts at articulation are based on an underlying literal interpretation of reflection, which can function as a mirror, hence the image earlier, but also as a contrasting element. Now, how do the fellows feel about that? Here's a good example by a research fellow named Caroline Schlotter, and it shows the scope of the challenge as experienced by many of the younger researchers. When writing about my own art, I often get the sense that work and words don't quite match. Like equal magnet poles, they repel one another, as if moved by an invisible force, they slide apart. Only by the utmost coercion, and only for short moments at a time, do I ever manage to bring text and work together surface to surface. And yet it is right here, in the quest for satisfactory verbal counterparts to the artistic process, that I want to linger. I have sought a voice that truly says what I mean, a voice whose inner timbre I can recognize, the voice of my unarticulated ideas. This has captivated me to the degree that it became one of my central areas of exploration. So, when we consider self-reflexivity, what we are asking is difficult. It entails nothing less than that search for voice, in addition to the other challenges of method and rigor that it raises. Acknowledgement of the complexity of the arts, and therefore of any research that is embedded in the arts, focus forces us to rethink all these elements and in the process to seek out fresh metaphors for explaining to ourselves and others the what, the how, the why of such research. Inspired by the work of Gillian Rose, and experiencing genuine concern about the pressure on the arts um, internationally to instrumentalize their arguments so as to justify the financial support they need in order to survive, I've been in a constant process of revisiting a metaphor of unfolding as a better way of understanding this self-reflexive process that goes on in artistic creation, interpretation, and presentation. If we could explain complexity without feeling the need to explain it away, that would seem to me a potentially helpful way to demonstrate why the world needs the arts and the particular truths which they hold. Using the word unfolding in this context, it implies a different relationship between the states of not understanding and understanding than that suggested by the more traditional research-related concepts of, say, invention or discovery. It carries a notion that knowledge is always close to us. 
and that it is already an intimate part of our everyday experience, yet it's somehow enigmatic and wrapped up inside itself until we use our skill to open it up and make it available for people's gaze. Of course, this is partly a matter of vocabulary and how the connotations of words have evolved and often diverged. One of the three common and therefore related definitions of unfolding is to remove the covers from. So literally, to discover. But perhaps it's worth looking at all three definitions and reflecting briefly on their shared and distinct properties. Unfolding can mean to open or spread out. So this carries the implication of expansion. And we like to think when we know more, we're more than we were. And it's in the sense that that folded object is highly compact and when unfolded, it occupies a greater space than before. So if we thought about the expansion of knowledge as distinct from pushing forward its frontiers, that could be one useful way of conceptualizing self-reflective work. You're opening and spreading out your work. Another idea, and it's already referred to, and that's to remove the covers and expose to view. Now, this is etymologically the closest to discovery, but it's interesting to note that it still implies the bringing out into open sight of something that's already there, but it's hidden. We could think of that cliche of something being hidden in plain sight, in which context an agency that brings it out of concealment may certainly be seen as contributing to knowledge or understanding. The final definition, I think, is in many ways the most interesting. It's to reveal gradually by written or spoken explanation to make known. And that reminds us that we often speak of narrative as something that unfolds. And that identifies unfolding as a process. And it's open to view through self-reflection, an ongoing exposition, <coughs> and one whose articulation is as significant as its end result of creating something that has been opened, spread out, and exposed to view and comprehension by others, and not merely by the self. Another hazard, though, of folding, to think really about what folding is, if we fold something that's flat. We turn something from a flat plane, sort of two-dimensional thing, to something that has more dimensions. It looks like it occupies a different kind of space. But whenever there's a fold, there is a weakness. Where you fold your paper or make a fold in your practice, you become weaker for a time because that's where the vulnerability is. It's where you make the new discovery. So unfolding, I think, is really opposite for artists because it allows for that time when the folding that we're trying to make in our doing and thinking to become better artists and make things more interesting is also a time of vulnerability. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. Why? Art's in part about making us see more clearly things that lie around us all the time, but which we often fail to attend to as we should. It's a call to attention that reminds us to work actively with all our senses so as to apprehend life in its detail, its richness. Maybe rather than relating only to knowledge as it's generally being perceived in, let's say, post-enlightenment Western thought, as this kind of relentlessly advancing vector, always improving, maybe it bears resemblance to other things, the kinds of philosophy that are interested in the expansion of wisdom through, say, the practice of thinking, of contemplation. This is a concept that chimes well with uncovering and expanding and a gradual narrative exegesis. Now, if this concept of unfolding may have a role to play in the development of vocabulary and conceptual framework for self-reflexive research, it's not the whole answer. Outside the conventions of established traditions such as that of scientific writing, language becomes slippery and vulnerable to misinterpretation, witting or unwitting. And there's hardly anyone on the planet now who's not a victim of that fact. Indeed, some scholars now of more scientific disciplines within music scholarship and other forms of uh, thinking, they're pushing back against, let's say, the linguistic liberties taken by artistic researchers 
And they're suggesting that all this unbridled messing about with language is not all it's purported to be. Some argue that it's merely a symptom of wider trends towards exaggerated subjectivity and reflexivity in a post-millennial world where all seems to be autobiography, reduced to selfies with blog captions underneath. So, it's very important for us to take note of what is happening to the power of our critical voices in this echo chamber of cyberspace. Does the emancipation of subjectivity as a component of the search for knowledge, doesn't it also make us vulnerable to the babble of pseudo self-realization with which we're inundated on a daily basis? Is the self-reflexive model an approach full of expressive potential, or is it a recipe for flattening that expression into banal egalitarian approaches where anything goes? Mightn't it lead us from time to time to bad decisions and not to good ones? These kinds of questions, obviously coming from a more skeptical stance, we have to engage with them. They have, we have to do that for the enrichment of our field, for the refreshment of our thinking, our doing, and our making. After all, it's nearly a quarter of a century, actually, since the term artistic research first gained currency more snappy and exciting than the various phrases such as practice-based research, practice-aimed research, and research in and through musical practice, with which it shares many connotations. It's also less specific in its meaning. And this, for us, is helpful, but it's also a problem. As I said before, many skeptics have challenged those who profess to be artists or searchers to explain what the formulation means. Finding the explanations lacking in their own terms have concluded that it's safe to dismiss it. Because this is, has in turn endangered a sense of defensiveness amongst proponents and practitioners of artistic research, this inhibits appropriate self-criticism. It also inhibits the creativity of artistic research. Any evidence supporting the concept by the pro-artistic researchers is sieved on sometimes rather too avidly, while misgivings are harder to voice. But this state of affairs, affairs, it can't be helpful to the long-term vitality of what we're doing. We have to learn now the next step. And that step, I think, is some kind of informed self-critical reflexivity. Not to undermine our discipline, but to strengthen it. We know the unresolved conceptual difficulties that persist, and if we're honest, we can also see quite clearly when, just as in other more firmly embedded disciplines, individual examples of artistic research fall below the standards we would hope for. But my presentation proceeds from the premise that this discipline, artistic research, is now strong enough not to risk self-annihilation by airing these issues. It aims to demonstrate the bringing of the discourse of criticism directly into the artistic research community not only enhances the quality and level of informedness, but it might make better artistic research and even better art. So I want to test this by looking at one more model that I've designed especially for this. So this is his first outing. We might call this a skeptic's set of questions for artistic research. Now, research to validate itself generally looks at these three categories, originality, rigor, and significance. If you're in the UK and you have to do research exercise every four years, which I used to have to do and thankfully don't, those were the three main categories that were dealt with, and they were graded by number, believe it or not. But for us, they have to sit alongside a different axis that deals with knowledge, artistry, and transferability. These are these two fields are forming a kind of, um, of vector that we can look at. So within each of these, let's ask some questions about originality and knowledge. Can artistic creation in and of itself generate new knowledge? We will all have views about that. But what's the difference between, let's say, the performance of the Beethoven sonata that doesn't seem to do that and the one that does? Next, rigor. Can that knowledge be mapped, defined, and quantified? If it's hard to do that, why? Why is it hard? What does that mean? And significance. This is always about the other now. 
Can such knowledge be of use to other researchers and to society at large? Now, artistry, much more difficult. Is there a correlation between the level of original knowledge generation and the quality of the artistic creation? I don't know. Sometimes it seems there isn't. Now, artistry and rigor. Can there be a reconciliation between a necessary dimension of artistic spontaneity and rigorous premeditation required by research? Aren't those two things contradictory? Now let's talk about significance. Is the art or the explanation that validates the artistic research output and gives, gives it significance? Which one are we actually talking about? Transferability. Can new steps of originality be built upon previous ones in ways which enable the discipline to evolve? That's really the classic scientific way of building up knowledge, but can we do that too? And how well can we do it? Is self-reflexive process of inward exploration, is it compatible with self-discipline as this might be objectively perceived? I think good, good autoethnography does this but good autoethnography is difficult to do. Now, significance. What value is one individual's successful self-exploration to others? This is the who cares question that occasionally pops up. Why does it matter to know somebody's personal uh, journey in their artistic research? Why would it matter to our discipline and why does it matter to the field as a whole? Now, for the moment, I'm not proposing to answer these questions, although we could discuss them. This is a kind of experiment. I believe that we as artists researchers need to contemplate them and to reflect on their significance uh, before we would close off deliberation with a kind of clean set of answers. I don't think this is what this is for. In any case, the answers we will find will themselves evolve, so we must continue to pose the questions as a recurrent exercise in self-discipline. All that I'm saying at this stage is that I'd really welcome a serious and realistic conversation to start along this side. And one reason why I think we're ready is that we now have a lot of accumulated case studies through which to examine, in more concrete terms than previously, the otherwise potentially abstract issues that are outlined here. There's a lot of artistic research out there now. Of course, the ultimate test of the questions of the long-term transferability and significance must relate to ideas and persons beyond the small expert community for whom artistic research was first generated and, in my view, will benefit from contributions coming from outside the discipline. Nevertheless, individual cases, while they may be idiosyncratic, can also provide a vital grounding of the discussion in the lived reality <coughs> of the artist researcher or the human being. And it's in this spirit, so we're getting near the end, that I offer this truly autoethnographical case as an example for your consideration. The case goes like this. What happens if the body of an expert musician, an artist, fails, dies, is resuscitated, and then reconstituted pharmacologically. What is the identity of the remade being if her practice is gone? Musical identity is largely based on the deeds that we do here and now. Most performance identity is on the here and now action. What of the lost practices of those who lose their practice? If the musician researcher can't be both those things at once, an artist and a researcher, if they must be concurrent rather than sequential, does this involve a, a renegotiation of the hybrid title? Can you be an artist and then a researcher and be an artist researcher? Or would your credibility be compromised? If there's a grain of truth in the cruel adage that the musician is only as good as their last performance, might there not be a more chronologically generous space in which <coughs> the artist researcher can gather performance experiences past, present, and through intensive reflection on those experiences, revivify them in their research. These are some of the outsider questions with which we as artists must engage. They are personal questions, but they're also utterly impersonal. They're pertinent outside their singularity, and they generate further research questions. What, for example, would be 
let's say a musical response, a dance response, to Derek Jarman's film Blue, with its lively soundtrack but unchanging blue screen. Gradually losing his eyesight through infections brought on by HIV AIDS, he asked the question as a filmmaker, if I lose half my eyesight, will my vision be halved? This is a self-reflective question, but it's a profoundly universal artistic one, and it's an important social question too. Here's my personal note that relates to Jarman's question. As a musician and a musicologist, paralleling, let's say, the author critic, I'm drawn to questions about meaning and metaphor in my chosen art form. I've done nothing else this evening but talk about metaphors. But as a former concert pianist, whose professional career had to end, when cancer produced impairment of the strength of my hands, I also speculate on my own identity, inside and outside my current professional context in higher arts education, and even standing here before you. Does my personal history have a validity inside writing, lecturing, institutions, and other activities? And do these more open, subjective mores emerging within the music field offer us avenues where that validity might be increased, which would mean that this kind of subjectivity is not useful to oneself, but to one's peers and to society. If that value cannot be found, then I would submit the questions, while well, interesting, are not really viable for research. This goes back to fundamentals for a sound autoethnographical model in which both the personal and the transpersonal elements must be present. Why? Because the world is not your own idea. For now, these questions for me are open-ended, but as I've written elsewhere, I can't escape the idea that in a world that's increasingly peopled by long-term survivors of all kinds of trouble, of social trouble, of deprivation, of lack of opportunity, we need an ethics of imperfection <coughs> as an adjunct to our critical task as artist researchers. But the recounting of such matters is not enough. What is also emerging here is the need for lucid, flexible forms of art making, writing, and that's one of the shortcomings for the moment of autoethnographical work. We need more and better models. Since there are several relatively new peer-reviewed online journals that aim to address this matter within artistic research, there are arenas now for necessary innovation. Here's one. The Nordic Journal for Artistic Research is called Vies. Um, in that journal, we're trying to use words, images, sounds, themes, and other manifestations and ways that honor this complex and elusive nature of the artworks and artistic practices that are the subject of our attention. Having just edited an issue of this on the subject of risk, these matters are on my mind, and yet I have my doubts. What is the justification for such care with words, such care for art, in a world where even supposedly more straightforward and concrete truths are being undermined by careless and, at worst, deceitful language. For that matter, how may we carry out this necessary act of explaining and justifying our endeavors, which seem very esoteric to some, in social and political arenas where experts are held in low regard and the debasement of language is being advanced? Conversely, let's be more positive about this, Mightn't there be a wider role for us to play in contributing to the defense of language, in promoting a deeper understanding of subjectivity, its strengths, its limitations, and casting light upon what happens in those moments and spaces where emotion and objectivity are singular, where they confront each other? I believe that we can enrich our discipline by seeking more trenchant answers to questions such as these. If engaging with art can help us to become better unfolders, using our feelings and intellect in combination as we strive for better understanding, it can also be an increasingly valuable tool for grappling with the complex interconnected phenomena that we encounter in our modern societies, and for helping to explain these phenomena to people who really are outcast from life's progress so that they might resume true enlightened participation. But while art can teach us useful lessons in unfolding, it can also offer us valuable insights into how our lives are governed more by process than outcomes. 
and art provides us with metaphors for this, and that helps us to gain <coughs> satisfaction and enrichment from it. As such, it is, again, an indispensable tool for understanding the world in which we live and how collectively, all together, we can get more out of it. We shouldn't overestimate the power of our disciplines to change the world for the better, but nor should we undersell their value as a corrective to the narrowing of vision of, and imagination that we see around us. Subjectivity may be indispensable to art making, but if it is exercised in the cause of illumination rather than self-dazzlement, it can benefit not just the artist him or herself, but others more widely. It is up to us to avoid whatever possible lure of the mirror is there and focus instead on the insights revealed by the lamp, the rays of our responsibly directed introspection for others. Why is this so important? It's all around us. The past few years have shown us the real danger of the misuse of certain kinds of power and the destruction of language, and 2019 continues to show us the plight that that generates, the plight of many in desperate circumstances who are forgotten by those in whose hands an ever-increasing majority of the power and wealth resides. If we wish to speak from an artistic point of view of empathy, then such marginalized groups are the people for whom we should reserve it, and in whose service we could dedicate part of our explorations. I hope that we can unfold a different story, one that helps us to link the concrete personal experience with a bigger artistic discourse in a way that isn't seen as just personal or just external, because if we can, we will show a few traces of the value, the continued value, the eternal value of working with art and through art. It is sorely, desperately needed. Thank you.